Uh, okay, so today we have uh, Vera Gay with us, and uh, I'm very excited to hear everything um, that they have to tell us. Okay, so hello everyone, um, and thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and talk to you about plain language. And uh, first of all, I would like to say that it's my strong suspicion that you're already writing in plain language. You just not, you don't necessarily know that there is a thing called plain language at, that, and that you're doing it. But um, when I was prepping for this presentation, I, um, I looked up um, just like, you know, technical writing best practices and stuff uh, on, on the internet. And, and the advice that I found there was like remarkably similar to what we do in, in plain language. So I think on the one hand, this will not be totally new to you. On the other hand, I sincerely hope that there will be something new to you that you can learn. Um, so let's get started. And, and also, I don't see the chat right now. So I will we'll just take, if you have a question, just put it in the chat, but we will get, get to it after, after the presentation. So, yes. Okay, first of all, what is plain language? I like starting with an example. Um, this is from plainlanguage.gov, uh, like a before after version of the same text. That it's, it's not really necessary to read all, all the text that I put up here. It's more about when you write in plain language, you try to like address the reader, you try to avoid long sentences, you try to usually use more lists. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so using words they, uh, they understand. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm getting there. I'm also a bit nervous. I'm just James. But it's not just about language. It's not just about words and sentences, but it's also about, for instance, images like this, this other example. This was on like tiny print in uh, on a sticker on a car. So instead of all the tiny print on a sticker on a car, which nobody will read if you make it into um, images, and use colors, for instance, um, that also will help people understand your point, like get you get your point. So, so plain language is not just about words; it's also about um, design. It's also about structure. It's also about selecting the content uh, that the people need, that um, the readers need. So, after these few examples, I'd like. To, I'd like to show you the definition of plain language. This is the internationally accepted definition. So a, a communication is in plain language if its wording, structure, and design are so clear that the intended readers can easily find what they need, understand what they find, and use that information. Um, I want to mention that I will share my presentation with James, who in turn can share it with you, because um, there are like links and stuff that you might want from it. So, so already here you can see that plain language is not just about the wording. It's also, as I mentioned, the structure and design of, of the document. It's also about the intended readers. So it's always about the audience. Who are you writing for? Are you writing for professionals? Are you writing for the public? It's always important. Um, and it also, um, it's a very like, Hmm. When you say that, like result-oriented definition, will will the intended users, readers, uh, be able to find what they need, understand that, and use that information? Um, if they will, then that communication is plain language is in plain language. If they won't, then it's not in plain language. It's like kind of simple as that. We will get back to what what this mean what this means and and how you can achieve that uh, a little bit later. Uh, but before that, um, the next question is, where can you use plain language? And my answer or our answer to that is basically everywhere, like in all functional texts, I would say. So everything that is not literature, basically. Because, because you can use it in like, in kind of any types of genres, like emails, brochures, guides, websites, wherever, like in it, it can, 
be used and it is used in every type of of genre it's, it, again except for literature um and this can be also used in like kind of all fields because government communication you know i'm sure well um, the, you, the uk government has some good things going like the gov.uk but i'm sure there are some organizations there or ministries who are not communicating as clearly as they should be but also health like medical information can be written in plain language financial information like anything you get from your bank or insurance company legal the, the legal field is also uh, so some some people would say yeah yeah plain language it's all good and well but you can't you can't, that law and legal things that's like above this you can't you can't be like legally precise and in plain language and and we say no you, you actually can and there are a lot of examples around the world where it's like already being done um and also technical writing actually so um i i was asked like how how plain language is applicable in technical writing and i and i think absolutely it's applicable and as i said you're probably already doing it just to just to share a story actually in in an earlier like in a previous life of mine, I used to be a software tester at an insurance company. And uh, one of my jobs were that we got, um, like there was some addition, to the change to the, to the software, and we got, you know, the new software, the new software package, and we got the specification. And, um, and I had to test the software against the specification. And once I, I learned the software, uh, I often found mistakes in the specification. It wasn't well written. There were like things missing from it. There were contradictory things. So I, I, you know, I started like telling them, okay, there are all these mistakes, and it's very expensive to fix things after the uh, fix like bugs and and issues after it has already been developed. So so what happened was that I, I first I was sent um, the specification before they started developing the software, so I could fix the specification so that it was in plain language as i later realized um and then later on um the the end result was was that i was writing the specification which was totally not my not in my job description as a software tester but i was the one who was able to write it in a way that it was comprehensive it had like every information needed it was uh everybody could find the information they needed there was there were no contradictions in it um and also what was super important that both the developers and the product people could understand it so i had two different audiences who had to like understand it and um uh, and that's that's what made me realize how 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 not self evident is writing plainly how uh, most of pe most people cannot do it or need to learn to do it because this is not a skill that's necessary like taught in school some people just like do it well because you know um because it comes easy to them but a lot of people just don't and i'm sure you 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 you've seen this in your careers so um so later on i realized that that here i was already like writing in plain language even though i wasn't um i i didn't know that at that time anyway so I, I, I really think that you can use plain language in every, everywhere, like any text I read, any text I come across in my everyday life, I'm always, I'm always like, hmm, this could be, this could be better written. Um, and, and this is not just for us. I mean, it's like plain language is not just important for me because I like things in plain language, but that everyone benefits from plain language because the reader will understand much faster what they need to do or what they want to do. And and uh, this this will be helpful for the author, for the organization that puts out the document, for instance, if their readers are more successful. And uh, And this is... So there's this like direct effect that if you write documents, then you can achieve your your um, purpose like much better. Like I don't know, more people will buy your product, will use your product correctly, you will get less customer calls, um, and so on and so forth. 
but there's a there's a higher level consequence as well which is that your people who might be your users or clients or um, whichever word you use for them they will trust you more they will trust the organization more and I think that's that's super important um, and also just an additional thought it's that uh, like with the text that I usually work on I, and I'm a filling language consultant which means I help companies rewrite their text and I train them to write better um, I, I usually work with like finance companies like banks insurance companies or utility companies and so on and and most of the text that they produce is is really really hard to understand so they are basically losing out on a lot of readers already because I'm I would say at least half of the half of their clients half of the customers can can just not understand what they are writing so plain language is also about inclusion like giving more people the chance to understand what uh, you're trying to communicate okay and moving on to principles of plain language and and for that I want to I want to go back to the definition because uh, we derive the principles from the definition and we and by this I mean in in the ISO standard that we are currently working on so there's a plain language ISO standard in the works hopefully it will be published at the end of this year um, so we started from the definition and we derived four principles one is uh, that that the document is what is what the readers need so that covers different things that that a it's in the language that they understand it's in in a format that uh, that they can use um and also most even more or like equally importantly the content in the document is what they need so that's the first one that it's it's relevant um and the second one is that that uh, that readers can find the information they need so that's more like within the document which has the good content for them they can find the good content so it's findable um and the third one is that once they found it right then it's understandable um this is most about language and then the result of all of this if the document is relevant if the information and it is findable and understandable then the document is usable so the readers can use um, the information or the document um, and i'm going to go into a few uh, details or techniques that that you can use for making these uh, happen so let's start with relevant. Um, I already said that this is this is about audience and contact. This is about knowing your audience, who you're writing for, um, you know, like demographic skills. I don't know um, how much they they like the digital skills. If you're writing something online and so on and so forth, what is their purpose? Why will they be reading that document? Is this something that like they want to learn about something is it uh, like we're sending them a letter and they just like want to figure out what what you want from them um do they want to do something specific so what is, what is their purpose in reading this document that you're writing what will be the context of their reading will they read it i don't know on a small screen while commuting um or will will they be reading it at home after dinner in like their cozy chair you obviously can know like all these details but but in general, like you can, uh, you can think about the context of reading because it uh, influences a lot of a lot of the ways um, you should uh, work with the document. What is your purpose? Obviously, you as the author, you as the organization, you want to achieve something. What what do you want to achieve? What do you need the reader to do? Um, and based on all this, like how you select content, that you should only select, you should only have content in it that the readers will need. And it's this is very, like, 
contradicting a lot of organizations way who, who, who ways who only think about like okay I want to write about this and this and this and this but actually you should be thinking about okay what does my reader need in this specific context so this is the first one relevant and the second one findable uh, it's uh, it's more about structure and design so how do you make that info how do you help the reader find the, the specific information um, so for for one, you can, and I'm, I'm I know that you're actually doing this. You can chunk the information so you can keep keep um, things that go together together, so like not scattered around um, different parts of the document of the document. You should order it logically, obviously logically for the reader and not logically for the author. Um, Write the most important information first. We know that people read the beginnings of the text, like that most people read the beginning and then then they like scan around and skip around and, and see, okay, what, what is important for me and what can, what can I use? Um, so, so put your most important information in the beginning. Mm. We are a big advocates on using headings, which uh, help people like, navigate the text um it's also this is also about highlighting important information be it with um, i don't know bolding be it with using i don't know images tables graphs call out boxes again i don't think i'm like saying anything new to you here um and also there are there are instances where you have to put in content that that most readers will not need but uh, you have to put it because a there might be one person who needs it or or you you have like i don't know regulations that that make it obligatory for you to put it in and you should how you should deal with it how you should like keep it separate and and maybe put it in the end and not in the beginning for instance so as not to so it's just you know to help the readers find the things that they actually need mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the third one is is understandable, which is mostly about language, and this is like you know sentences, words, paragraphs, mostly. So let's start with words, the smallest things. Um, so first of all, use words that are familiar to your reader. And again, we're getting back to the to the audience. You have to know who your audiences. If you talk to professionals, it's perfectly fine to use jargon, like technical jargon. But if you talk to the public, then you shouldn't be using technical jargon. And if you must use technical jargon, then you must explain it. Um, you should use words like consistent words. So like one, one word should have one meaning and one meaning should be attached to one word. You should use concrete words, like as concrete as possible. For instance, um, if you're talking about a hammer, then call it a hammer, don't call it a tool. Because you know a hammer that 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 prompts a, a mental image in your in your reader's brain. I know what a hammer is. If you just say tool, and what you actually mean is a hammer, the tool will not really prompt like a mental image in your reader's brain. So moving on to sentences, there are like a lot of other advice. I'm really just trying to give you the the very gist of of what we're saying. So moving on to sentences, like our First and foremost, they should be relatively short. We know that the longer the sentence is, the harder it is for people to understand. And usually sentences are super long because people want to communicate every little thing in that sentence, like every related information. But actually you should be only putting one main point of information in one sentence and the next one in the second sentence and so on. One of the, I don't know, cornerstones is of plain languages, if possible, address the reader. What do we mean by addressing the reader? Is that you talk to them. So instead of talking in, in uh, or writing in third person, I, the, the user should do this, or I don't know, X, Y should do that. We say, you should do that. And this way, it's, um, this is useful for, for several reasons. One is that um, 
it's it's much more informal it helps build the relationship between you and your reader and um, and also sorry just a second so also when when you say i don't know the author the user the whoever should do this and that the, the readers always have to make these like tiny, tiny little translation in their head, like, okay, that means me. And, and a lot of the things that we talk about, these are like, these, these calls like extra, extra work for the brain. And like a lot of these extra works for the brain put together, make a text hard to read. So we're trying to, you know, get rid of as much as we can of the extra unnecessary, unnecessary brain work. Um, okay, so addressing the reader is so important for us that actually we're kind of, um, we're having an issue with ISO at this moment because the ISO, the standard about writing ISO standards, basically, uh, they prohibit the use of personal pronouns. They prohibit the use of you. And we really want to use you in, in our plain language standard. So now we're asking ISO for a derogation um, from this rule so that we, in our plain language standard, can model plain language guidelines and, and say, you should do this. Um, okay, I see a uh, chat. So um, how, how do I address uh, the audiences when your readers have different roles? That's a very, very good question. Um, and that's, that's why I said, depends on, really depends on the text. Because if there is a primary audience, like in our in our case, in the ISO standard, we say that authors will use the standard, and those authors can be, you know, like a lot of um, uh, a lot of roles actually, but people who who author the document. Um, so in that case, we we define in the beginning that by you we mean the author, and whenever we mean somebody else, then we use their that noun actually um usually texts have a primary audience so for instance i was uh, rewriting terms and conditions for an insurance document recently it's 100 page long it took us a year and a half it was a lot of fun mm. and there like the primary reader of the document is the person who is uh, not contracting but you know how it's called i don't know like who's, who's buying the insurance right um so there again in the beginning we define that okay by you we mean you who will like sign the contract with us oh because the other part of this this rule not rule but guideline is that when we talk about um the organization who who writes the document we use we so by you we mean you the buyer of the insurance and by us we mean we the insurance company and whenever there is somebody else coming in like another role coming in then obviously we will use that proper noun um so i'm sure there are some some instances when there when your audiences are like so diverse or you don't have a primary audience and and then you can't use this i understand that i'm just saying that whenever you do have a primary audience it's worth thinking about it. Okay, we also um, say that you should use the active voice unless you have a, a good reason to use the passive, simply because the active voice makes it clear who does what. Um, another, this is, this is a more like language specific um, guideline is that you should try to keep the subject verb and object together and preferably in the beginning more or less in the beginning of the sentence because these are the basic building blocks of the sentence uh everything else gets their meaning in comp what, like in in relationship to the subject verb and object so um so if you if you scatter them around the sentence they it will be much harder for your reader to understand um okay i i will get back to the to to the to the comments later sorry but i i i'm losing my focus so avoiding nominalizations it's uh what is nominalization 
like when you say make a decision instead of saying decide. So decision is a nominalization because you're hiding a verb in that noun. So in general, sometimes they are useful, but in general, we use a lot more nominalizations. We, we hide the action in the noun and it's better to use strong verbs, verbs instead. Okay, just very shortly about paragraphs. Um, they should be short enough. Um, they should be about one topic and not like about different topics. And, and also in the beginning, it should be clear what, what that paragraph, uh, what, what the topic of the paragraph is. Um, non-text content, it's like images, graphs, tables, videos, whatever. Um, a lot of times they help, they can help understanding. Um, and sometimes they can't. So like, you know, just use them when when you think it does help understanding um and coherence um so like the whole whole document should be coherent like consistent whichever word we use like the information design like how it looks like your word choice your tone um the how the bullets look um and so on and so forth um um i i i think you you all get this and then the last principle is valuation. So this is, uh, as I said, if you if you manage to do the first three, that means that your your document will be in plain language, but you you cannot really be sure. So you can do like re, you can review your own document. You can ask others to review. You can also use checklists. Um, like the ISO standard will also have a checklist, but you can also find plain language checklists on the internet. Um, so so um, mm, yeah, so you can review your document against these checklists, but uh, the only way to make sure that it is actually in plain language is in plain language if you if you test it with users, um, which is I know not always feasible, but um, it doesn't cost that much money. And and once the document is actually published, you can use like you can measure the outcome. Did they do what you wanted them to do? Did the number of customer um, customer calls, like incoming customer calls, like grow or not about this topic or about this letter and so on? So um, this is what I want to tell you about evaluation. And now um, James asked me to talk about organizations, like plain language organizations a bit. And then uh, once I've done that, I We'll get back to your questions. So there are three major international, well, not just not, not major, there are three international language organizations. One is Clarity, Clarity International, which um, is for people who are interested in plain legal language. There is Plain, Plain Language Association International, which is for anybody who's interested in plain language, so not just legal, regardless of the field. Um, and there's the Center for Plain Language, which is also for kind of anybody, but this is more for people in North America. And these three organizations have like, got to, they got together and formed the International Plain Language Federation, of which I'm a chair, um, for the purposes of, of, of working on things that are in the interest of all people in like all, all organizations. What do I mean by that? It's, it was the federation or, or its predecessor that worked on coming up with a definition, like a common definition of plain language. Um, because we, we had like a lot of different definitions, but, um, but now we have the one that's accepted and, uh, and that we're building the standard on. So that was the first step. And then, um, it was the um, the federation that started working on the ISO standard so that we have uh, an internationally accepted, debated um, standard that says, okay, when we say something is in plain language, this is what we mean. So that's a super important step for us. And the next steps that we just started working on and we will continue working on in the next couple of years is one, um, 
implement a, like adaption of the of the of the ISO standard so that more like uh, people should use it also localization of the ISO standard because again this is an international standard we try to write it as language specific as possible um, but that means that uh, that people should should like adapt like localize it in their own country and put in more language specific uh, advice and also translate it in in non not english uh, language countries as, as mine i'm from hungary um so we're working on this and we also started work on uh plain language training and uh plain language uh certification and we don't know yet um what uh, what we want to certify, like, do we want to certify individuals? Do we want to certify documents or organizations, or maybe all of them, just like in one of the orders? So we are we're currently in uh, like figuring this out, but this is all a part of of professionalizing plain language, that like making it clear that this this is a profession and that we have you know standards and and uh, um, requirements in place, basically um yes so uh and yeah just one more thing that all these all these uh organizations that you can see here these are all volunteer run so we don't have paid staff like everybody's a volunteer and i know of one plain language organization in the uk that's the plain english campaign that has been there for like a while now so you might have heard of them it's uh, the director is Martin Cutts, as far as I know, and um, um, there might be others, I don't know, but I know of them. And if you want to learn more about uh, plain language, then I would recommend Martin Cutts, uh, as I mentioned, his Oxford Guide to Plain English. It has, like, it, I think it has, it, it said it's like sixth edition by now or something. The latest edition came out like very, um, like not not uh, not so long ago um it's a very entertaining read and a good 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 basis for for plain english and and uh, not expensive on top of that um there's also um there's also the plain language .gov, which is the u.s government plain language website kind of they do have a free a lot of free resources including a guide for, for plain language. There's also the plain ding ding group. Anybody can join that. You don't have to be a plain member. Again, all the links are in there and I will share them with James who will share them with you so you can find them if you're interested. Um, and if you want to get involved, uh, one, I would uh, strongly encourage you to consider joining plain. It's not anybody can join it it's not expensive we do because i'm also on planes board you know it's a small word um so we we also do uh e-journals twice a year there's a lot of resources on the website plane members um plane members have uh, or like get discounts on on the conferences because one of the other things that we do is we do comfort plain language conferences which I, I love them. Like I, I truly love them. I wouldn't miss them for a word. The next one is the Access Program Conference uh, in May this year. This is uh, organized together by the three big organizations, so Clarity Plain and the Center for Plain Language. It's all vir virtual. And even though it's all virtual, it, it's not boring at all because it already had um, like the first part in October um, and I loved it. And I think if you can check it out because it's going to be great. Mm, yes, so um, you will find me on LinkedIn, you will find my email addresses here, the the official federation one and my private, I mean not private, but my work one, the Hungarian one, if you need to reach me. Um, so that was my presentation.